I'm Dr. Amy R. Cohen, and I'm a classics professor and director of the Center for Ancient Drama at Randolph College. Another detail for you to pay attention to when you're thinking about Greek drama is who's on stage and who's playing those parts. If you keep track of that while you're looking at a Greek play, you'll discover a lot more about the play, what the playwright was trying to get across. So let me show you a way to do that and then tell you a little bit about why I think it's so important. Let's use as our example Sophocles Antigone. Start yourself a chart when you begin the play. Note the line number when a character first starts to speak and put it at the top and put the character's name on the side. Put an X in the box. Start a new column with new line numbers when somebody exits or when somebody new enters. Don't necessarily trust stage directions if you're reading a translation. Almost none of them are ancient and the translator or editor has had to write those based on what they can deduce from what the characters say. You do the same. Treat the chorus as one character. The first thing this exercise does is make you remember that this is a play. The physical presence of people in a playing space is impossible for an audience to ignore, but if you're reading a play, it's easy to forget that there are a bunch of other people reacting to a character who's giving a long speech. The chorus, just the chorus, was at least 12 people also on stage, just to start with. You might also notice, especially if you use separate indicators for when characters are on stage but don't say anything, who is significantly silent. Famously, for instance, Cassandra is on stage for a long time in Aeschylus' Agamemnon before she speaks, and Alcestis, in Euripides' play about her, says nothing after Heracles brings her back from the dead. That's easy not to focus on when the actors aren't in front of you, but those silences might have a pretty big impact on the way you understand the plays and the characters in them. And one other thing to notice when you remember that the Athenians originally used as few actors as possible, and that that was usually, but not always, just three in a tragedy. Which roles are being played by the same actor? Let's go back to the Antigone chart. If you want to figure out how to divide the speaking roles, leave the chorus out, find a scene with three characters in it, and assign one of the actors to each character. Give each of those roles a separate designation. I'll use colors, and I'll shade the character throughout the play the same color. Then look for another three-character scene, and you might find that you only have one actor available to play one of the roles. Here, Ismini's actor, Blue, is the only actor available to play the sentry, and so he's going to be played by the Blue actor, even when there are not three characters in the scene. By this kind of logic, and adding some awareness of how long it takes to get on and off stage and other considerations, you can divide the roles among the three actors. Why does this matter? Well, look at the roles in yellow here. There's still more than a third of the play left after the character Antigone exits for the last time, but we continue to hear her actor's voice, first in the character of Tiresias, who, with prophetic authority, endorses Antigone's actions, and then in the character of the messenger, who gives an account of Antigone's death. That's a whole extra level of meaning and connections that Sophocles included in the way he constructed his play. I think that when you notice that detail of Sophocles' stagecraft, you're getting closer to the full richness of the play that his audience experienced. Give it a try with your own favorite Greek drama.